everyone and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, Movie Talk for Movie Fans. I'm your host Natasha Martinez and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this Friday is Dennis Zen. Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. It's Friday and I'm very, very excited about that. And I'm <laughs> excited about all the news that we're going to be talking about. Also joining us, Perry Nemera. Hi, I am Perry and I love cute animals that eat Reese's Pieces, mm. unlike someone at this table. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting called out. Like, yeah. I couldn't help it. The one who started it all with this E.T. Gray is a Christian Harloff. No, we get it. You got that. Oh, look at me. I've got a smile. I'm a really nice person who hates really lovable animals. Who's doing that? Stop that. Uh, <laughs> it is, I, what's wrong with you? You hate Reese's Pieces. You hate E.T. No, people have been saying that they also agree with me that E.T. was terrifying for them as a child and they to this day won't watch it. So I have a support group. Like I'm starting. Be you know, e good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we get into our uh, regular scheduled programming, we do have another topic that was brought up. It's actually related to our first topic, but it's about the Batman v Superman R-rated slash director's cut. Zack Snyder has come out and talked about it. Uh, in reference to Jenna Malone's character, who, you know, there was all those rumors and pictures of her on set, and I, apparently she's been cut from the theatrical version of the movie, but she will be in this extended slash director's cut. Uh, but he, Zack Snyder did say this. I think we should keep it private, but it's nothing that's been talked about. She's definitely not Robin or Batgirl. I'm happy to say that. He also talked about the length of the film. He said it was around three hours and that he actually, not the studio, was the one that wanted to cut it down to two and a half, two and a half for the theatrical. And the theatrical version... Even still, the credits are super long. It's down to like two hours and 22 minutes. Um, Christian, what do you think about this? I mean, look, we talked about this a few weeks ago when those rumors were coming out. I also thought what was interesting was that they had always thought about releasing kind of a rated R cut even before Deadpool, but they didn't kind of hold back. They didn't just say, oh, we were always thinking about it. They were like, no, but because it was so successful, Deadpool that is, that's why we're kind of going far, uh, further with it. And I think that we... I always thought this was going to happen. I think because Zack Snyder has traditionally, a lot of his movies have been rated R. His violence has been rated R. I also like Ben Affleck's comments about how he was saying, look, there's a version of it. I'm glad that they went PG-13 so I can show my kids. And I think that also to a lot of the audience, even, even not necessarily younger kids who want to see Batman, but I mean, there, there are kids that are under 17 that, that want to see Batman, really want to check out Batman and should be able to see it. But I also think to be able to give a rated R version is really cool. As far as the length of the film, um, I still think I'm 230 for the amount of stuff that they're putting in this movie. I get it. I understand because there's a lot of setup. Three hours is going to be an interesting watch. Um, let, let's see. I also love the setup for, for Justice League in there, that they're admitting that they're doing that. The Jenna Malone stuff, that's why you always take things with a grain of salt. There were so many reports going, she's Robin. She's, yeah. the new, she's the new Robin. It's like, clearly she's not. She was cut out of the film. Um, so, yeah, I... I, I dig the comments and I think that it kind of goes with a lot what we were talking about. Perry? I really dig his comments because when this first popped up as a rumor right after Deadpool came out, I'm like oh, I see what you're doing here. That feels like a cash grab. But based on the quotes in, in these articles, I mean, it seems like he really does have the material to warrant this R-rated director's cut. And like, as we know he shoots this kind of stuff gorgeously and I latched on to Ben Affleck's uh, quotes too because growing up, I wouldn't have been able to see the original right. Batman movies and that would have been terrible for me. The only thing that somewhat concerns concerns me about this is how they're saying there's a lot of other things that are going to be in this director's cut versus the theatrical cut and that's great for us fans who are going to buy and watch this but what about the average moviegoer I mean the only thing that I could think of that might make it easier for people to digest and still understand everything is that maybe if these extra things that connect to the bigger uh, DC cinematic universe and the Justice League hints he was talking about if they're kind of like Easter eggs in a way that you know nobody has to see them all to understand what's going to happen in the next movie. So I just want to make sure that what we get in the theatrical cut versus the director's cut doesn't kind of eliminate the wider audience. And from his statements, it, it, I mean, we have uh, Jenna Malone's character is not going to be in a theatrical. That means it's not a super pivotal role. Mm -hmm. He also mentions a tease to Justice, like a bigger one. I'm surprised that's something that's not going to be included in the theatrical version. Right. If he's saying, okay, there's going to be this big tease to Justice League, and that's not going to be there. Also, I think with the rated R stuff, it's not going to be a, like a Deadpool situation where it's like foul language and lots of blood and guts. He said it was more just the intensity. They're saying like they give R ratings for just more intense violence, more things. So I don't think it's going to go that route. 
What about what do you think about that? Do I think it's going to go down with with the more intense violence in the movie? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we're going to have some intense. Fi- I think you kind of you kind of have to. I think that there's some things that he made in the cuts to to bring it down. That and he's that's what he's saying is there's just not a lot of blood in the film. It's the matter the the amount of violence. I mean, even the stuff that you see in the trailer with Batman snapping necks and and all those type of things. I think that you're going to have to get some of that from. It's a fighting movie, Batman v Superman, you know, and I think there's going to be a lot of violence for sure because I think there's going to be a lot of destruction. We've seen in the trailer, it's not a spoiler anymore, that Doomsday shows up. That's going to cause a lot of chaos, destruction. So, um, no, I, I think that we will get a lot of extreme violence. That's what Snyder does. We yeah. also know how these ratings work. I mean, whether or not it's a big, like, neck snapping or blood spurt coming out, I mean, any single frame could make them go, oh, R instead of PG-13. So who knows how far he's really going to push it in this cut. They're not going to talk out their problems. Batman, be, Batman, Superman, just sit it out. Right. That's, that, that's the whole movie. They're Two crying like talking. Spider-Man 3. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, what's the first topic? Entertainment Weekly writer Anthony Bresnikan was able to get an early look at Warner Brothers' biggest film to date, Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. In a tweet heard around the world, Bresnikan took to Twitter to share his thoughts. He said, if you love Man of Steel, you'll love Batman vs. Superman. If you loved Man of Steel but not the ending, Batman vs. Superman may redeem that. If you hated Man of Steel and the whole grim slash dark thing, okay, probably not for you. Wonder Woman is fearsome. There's a moment between Batman and Superman that will make even the most cynical tear up a little. Fans will have a lot to discuss and fight over. Dennis, what are your thoughts on Batman vs. Superman's first mini review? From what he's saying, I'm guessing this is the movie, I'm gonna get what I'm expecting. I'm gonna like the movie, but I'm not gonna love it, because that's how I felt about Man of Steel. Unlike uh, Campy or Schnepp, who loved Man of Steel, I, I liked I liked it, and I have a feeling this is going to be along those same lines, which means this is going to be a very divi- divisive film when it comes out because there's going to be people that are going to absolutely love it, and there's going to be people that are going to absolutely hate it. The one interesting thing that he points out, though, is what is this moment between Batman v Superman that's going to get us teared up? Because I guess that was one of my issues with Man of Steel is I felt like there needed to be some slower, quieter character moments that we didn't get to see. Are we going to get those in Batman v Superman, Perry? I actually really like that point, and I like the point that he makes at the end that uh, I'm not in- entirely sure what he means by fight over, whether that's going to be in a negative or a positive way, but he really covers everything with this movie in terms of like having a little emotion, having something that we could talk about after, which is really, really important in these kinds of movies, and then also just addressing the fact that, it's, that it is going to be as grim and dark as we've seen in the trailers. I'm just kind of still surprised that he got away with this tweet to begin with. I mean, it seems like some sort of marketing play. You know, they have him in, they let him tweet this, and fine. I mean, it's much better that we have some serious stuff to talk about here versus him just coming out and being like, so it was great, guys. Have fun waiting a couple more weeks. But... I try to stay away from people's early reviews until I can formulate my own opinion, but the way he formatted this tweet made me think, oh, you know, which category do I fall in? And now I have to assess it that, assess it that way. But overall, positive tone. I'm happy. Let's get to the release now. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. That, when this, this came out, it was confusing because we were talking about it this morning. It's yeah. like, then he, then he made another retweet saying, well, this isn't my review. This is just kind of putting things together. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, wait, did you, did you see it? So it seems like he did see it, but he was just kind of saying, just here's a couple of thoughts, not my overall thoughts of what I'm th- I thought of the movie because that's probably, you know, that the Warner Brothers wanted him to, to clarify that because he, this dude is tapped in with all the studios because he was the guy who was at celebration star wars celebration he was the one moderating the entire panel he was the guy that basically was with jj abrams when they introduced the trailer the first time when people went bananas over it um so he's locked into the studios in general you always see him he was at the oscars i mean he's 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 locked into all the studios so then he he's not going to ruin his relationship just by throwing up a review there but they probably said to him hey just clarify that that's not a review. Has he ever done something like this before? Um, With a big release? In, in, I, I don't want to say that he hasn't, but I don't know that it, that it got the kind of um, traction that this thing's getting. Mm-hmm. So because it's Batman v Superman, it's coming out, it's right around the corner. As far as like what he said, I think that this pretty much what you said, Dennis. It goes back to what we're expecting. I think I think that for me, I really enjoyed Man of Steel. I know that it, it has its its haters out there too, um, but I really enjoyed it. I liked it a lot. I actually like it the more I watch it, uh, and I think that if it's for me. If it's similar to Man of Steel, then good, sign me up. I'm ready to go. Now, I know that other people 
feel the opposite that they want more than what they got in Man of Steel. But I'm the dark tone, all that stuff. As far as the moment between, I'm very curious what that <laughs> yes. moment is. It's going to make us tear up, and it, it, it's, they're going to hug it out. Yeah, we need. To, but this also makes me with a report that came out the other day about Ben Affleck helping with some some script. of the script and stuff too, and and he's really good at. at Emotional emotional moments. If you look at any of his movies with the town or Argo or Goodwill I mean, Hunting, uh, he helped write well, that. Well, he helped write that for sure. Right. And then you know, Gone Baby Gone, all those movies. He knows emotion. So if he if if he's in the scene that does it, I buy that that that's going to happen. So I'm very curious for the release. We're right around the corner. It's going to be a topic of discussion on this show, I'm sure, and all over the place. I can already see the love comments. I can see uh, the hate comments. Mm. It's going to be. World War Three. Okay, let's play a game here. Yeah. What percentage on Rotten Tomatoes are, do you think Batman v Superman is going to get? I'm going to say. You want to do an over under? No, no. Let's go straight give, up. Give it, yeah, okay. I'm okay. going to say sixty eight percent on Rotten Tomatoes. I'll go sixty four. Oh, okay. I'm going to be the high one here and say seventy one. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> What's next? Among the huge slate announced by Warner Brothers way back, we got confirmation about the entire cast set up to appear in Justice League, save one member, Green Lantern. Very little is known about Green Lantern and who will be playing him. Among the coverage from this week's Entertainment Weekly on Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, Producer Charles Robin says we'll see a fully formed Green Lantern most likely in Justice League Part 2. He said every beat of the movie is not yet worked out, so there's the possibility that he may or may not be in Justice League 2. For now, we felt that we were introducing enough characters that the best possible place we could put Green Lantern is some introduction in Justice League 2 or bearing that a movie after. Christian, thoughts on having to possibly wait until Justice League 2 for Green Lantern to appear? Um, I think that that's their plan for now, but I don't know if that's going to stick because I think that the fans are calling for Green Lantern, and I think that just as of right now, they have so many characters they are dealing with, so I understand the statements, and I think that might be right now in the plan they announced Green Lantern Corps, uh, Green Lantern core as coming out in I don't know when they announced that particular date if they even did but that they were developing it but I think that we're going to get him before Justice League 2 I, I I just think that that the problem is that that last movie has such a stink on it they want to get away from it they want to really establish this new DC cinematic universe and then they want to introduce him I can't wait for him I still want John Stewart I still want Nate Parker to play John Stewart I don't know if that'll happen. We'll see. I'm hoping that the buzz of Birth of a Nation gets him a lot more meetings. I'm sure it will. And I hope that he's in a big franchise as well. And I hope that that's the role that he's cast for. And then they introduce him earlier. So personally, I think he'll be introduced uh, before Justice League 2. I want Green Lantern, but I lean towards what they say in that quote, where there's so many characters coming right now, I don't want them to put him in and have him swallowed up by all them. Right. But... I'm also thinking that because of what happened with the previous movie, maybe they might be going the other way. Even though fans are calling for it, they might be so scared at this point. And they're going to want to do it right. So they're going to want to take their time to do it right, which means we might not get him for a while. But there was another quote in there from a WB exec. Uh, he said that, uh, I guess I can say to the Green Lantern fans, if they can be patient with us, I think, they really w I think they'll really be happy. And that right there sums up how I feel about the whole thing. If I am patient and you make me happy, fine by me. Just do it right. Yeah, I'm a little surprised. I thought they would have brought him in earlier because, you know, there was like rumors of maybe him showing up in the, like a cameo with Batman v Superman. Obviously, if he's not coming maybe until Justice League Part 2, he's definitely not going to cameo. They haven't cast anyone yet. You know, and also, I, I think you're right. They, they are a little hesitant because of the stink of the last film. It, that's why they're not doing a Hal Jordan thing. They're doing the Green Lantern Corps, right. which we don't know who that is yet. We're, I'm thinking it's going to be Hal Jordan, John Stewart and uh, Guy Gardner. I don't want to see Kyle Rayner. I think he's a boring Green Lantern. Um, but I hope it's those three. Uh, do you guys have any ideas about who who do you think they're going to use for, for Green Lantern? Yeah, I don't know all that. So <laughs> I will defer to you two. I, I would agree with you. I think that for right now, it'll probably be Hal and, uh, and John. But we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it's. The, I think that it's also it really going to depend on the audience feedback more than anything else. It's not going to be a critic's feedback. It's going to be an audience feedback on how Batman v Superman, Justice League, and Wonder Woman do. And then, it, because they're also, because if those movies really crush with the fans, they're going to really design those movies. Suicide Squad, we know, is, is we're going to talk about it in a little bit here. Like, they're going to go further along with that one. Um, so, 
I, right now it's a matter of who we are going to cast, how we're going to do it, when we're going to put him in it. So that's, but I do think we're just going to get him before Justice League Two. When's Justice League Two even slated to come out? 2020. Two that. 2019 and then Green Lantern Corps is 2020. That's a long time away. Yeah, I think is, we're gonna. I think we're gonna introduce them before then. I and think it's important that they don't make it. any promises too. Like you want to have the fluidity when you're dealing with a cinematic universe above all else too. You need to be able to change things around after development. Like I'm sure they're mapping things out really extensively right now. But even after something moves from development to pre-production and even into production, you need the room to breathe in order to make this right. Depending on what comes out before it. But then also, if you you're gonna have Darkseid as the main villain, if they, he's like the Thanos uh, for for DC. It, it, you, you're dealing with intergalactic cosmic type things. Wouldn't you want to bring something like Green Lantern Corps into it earlier? Which yeah. makes me think that Justice League 2 might be the perfect time to say, here's what this is and what you can expect, especially for people who do not know this world right. that extensively. So it seems kind of appropriate to me right now, based on what I know of what they're doing so far, that they introduce it there and then we get the full movie in 2020. Okay. All right. Now on to buy or sell. Natasha, what do we have? The first trailer for Disney Lucasfilm Star Wars The Force Awakens Blu-ray debuted yesterday, revealing a ton of new things for the fans to enjoy. The Blu-ray combo pack and DVD package will contain a number of special features, including a full-length documentary, a look at the table read that started it all, building BB-8, showing how the filmmakers brought the newest joy to the screen, a featurette showing personal insights into the score of Star Wars The Force Awakens, along with deleted scenes and so much more. Star Wars The Force Awakens will be available for streaming on April 1st with the Blu-ray combo pack dropping on April 5th. Perry, buy or sell the Blu-ray release for Star Wars The Force Awakens. Do you even have to ask me? <laughs> I know, buy, right? And literally buy. I must own this. I must own it now. But speaking just about the trailer, I love this trailer. It's almost like it's happening all over again. This trailer incorporates the perfect amount of footage from the film that kind of makes me all pumped about what mm -hmm. I loved so much a couple of months ago. And then it also teases just enough behind the scenes stuff. So this really was the perfect promo for, for this release. But then there's so much on here that I'm dying to see. I mean, the deleted scenes, of course, but I'm really psyched for the feature documentary. Then I want to see the piece about the table read too, because that image of the table read is so ingrained oh, in my yeah, it's mind. Oh, iconic. I want to see what what that really was like in that room. And then I am obsessed with BB-8, as many people know. So that featurette that's going to explain how they did BB-8. I, I love movie magic too. So to see one of how one of my favorite characters was brought to life, ugh. Can't wait. Uh, so I'm guessing, Christian, you're going to be passing on on purchasing this. I don't need it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, we talked about it a lot on council because originally what they were going to do was they were going to release the digital first, and then two or three weeks later they were going to do the Blu-ray. And we were and everybody, Tiffany and John and and Mark were all like, "Yeah, we're going to do both." I'm like, "Why?" I'm like, "Why are you going to do both?" So now we don't have to do both. You can do five days later it comes out. And for me, it's the deleted scenes as well because I know. I've read a lot about these scenes. The ones that, that stand out to me, was, and we talked about it kind of on, on the show on Jedi Council yesterday, was Kylo searches the Falcon. Because there's a scene in there to where there's an emotional moment that happens in The Force Awakens, if you haven't seen it, that John had made the point, if there had been something leading up to that a little bit more, that that would have made more of an impact for him. And I said, well, there was a scene originally that was supposed to be in there with Kylo Ren on the Falcon. And now that's going to be in the deleted scene. Now, whether or not you want to get into a canon conversation, it's a whole other show. Watch for it on Jedi Council. But I, I, the, the special features, the table read stuff, all of it, I'm just going to lock myself in a room, watch it over and over and over again for a little bit. It's, uh, it's exciting that's coming out so soon. Yeah, if you guys don't know, the deleted scene titles are Finn and the Villager, Jakku Message, X-Wings Prepare for Light Speed, Kylo Ren Searches the Falcon, Snow Speeder Chase, and Finn Will Be Fine. That snow speeder chase, by the way, it's funny because I because that's in the book and it's also they've they've we they've talked about it. So Ray and Finn go on a chase and get chased by troopers and everything outside of the base, and they shot all of it obviously, and it's it's a deleted scene because after I read a part of, a part of it and had heard about it when you see the movie again and you see them kind of randomly on a speeder, you're like, what the hell are they doing out there? And now this explains why. Yeah, and also you see randomly that Ray has Finn's jacket and then hmm. and then right. suddenly he gets it back. I, right. I need to know why that happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah, deleted scenes for me, great. I want to see those. I mean, I I don't know if we're in the minority, but we, not many people buy Blu-rays, but I still do. And it's mainly for a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. I want to see all all the making of, especially movies that I, I really enjoy watching. So I, I'm definitely buying this one. All right, what's next? 
With only a few weeks to wait for Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, DC fans are looking even farther ahead for Suicide Squad. Early buzz for the movie is remarkably positive, according to a number of rumors from people seeing the film. And now, Variety is reporting that behind closed doors, Warner Brothers is also so thrilled with the movie, they are beginning to develop a sequel even though one hasn't been dated as of yet. The report also says that Warner Brothers wants it as quickly as possible and are looking for a writer since director David Ayer will be busy with his next project, Bright. Dennis, buy or sell a Suicide Squad 2? Well, since none of us have actually seen the movie and we don't know what the box office is yet, I'm going to speculate and say that I'm going to buy it. I also will speculate this. While Suicide Squad won't make as much money as uh, Batman v Superman, I actually think both critically and with fans, I think it's going to be better received. And I, I think Warner Brothers must be super happy with what they've seen so far. With David Ayer, is he coming back to direct or not? If they're having someone else write it, but maybe they'll have someone else write it and then he comes comes back just to direct it. Um, but for now, I'm going to buy it. Christian? I'm going to buy it as well. We talked about it briefly on the show yesterday. And, and we were, Perry, you've made the point that well, it looks like one of us is going to have to be is going to be happy with this movie. That's why they're releasing it, and it seems like Variety r r confirmed that. And if that's the case, yeah, because I was just worried about because they did the same thing. Fantastic Four, they were so happy about it, and they Fantastic Four Two is coming out, and then we also how that how that panned out. So this movie, the fact that they are confident, in it, it, it gives me hope because I'm very excited for Suicide Squad. I, I'm it's one of the movies I'm looking forward to the most this year because it's so original that we get to see the villains in the forefront. Um, you know, and to see Will Smith play a different role, and Margot Robbie, who I'll watch, you know, eat a Snickers bar. It's fine. Like so, and it, it, like it, this to me is going to be a movie. I feel this could be a really good franchise for them. So it's I buy it. My question to you though is, which Fox executives were watching Fantastic Four, going, "Oh, this is great. We're going to make a sequel to it." I think they announced it before they even started shooting oh, it, though. God. Oh boy. Yeah, uh, the, so it, it's silly. <laughs> Perry. Yeah. yeah, I don't like judging a movie by its trailer, but in this case, I'm going to have to bypass that and make this a big buy. And I'm going to go as far to say that that trailer will probably be one of my favorite trailers of the year at the end of the year. It's incredible. This is something insanely different that I am super pumped for. It looks gorgeous. And I'm thinking they're probably banking on this being this year's Guardian of the Galaxy 2. And if that's the case, obviously they're going to want to jump into a sequel as soon as it hits because that's going to be beneficial to them. So I have the highest hopes in the world for this movie, and I can't wait. You know what it is also, you know, going back to the Fantastic Four discussion, is that what Fantastic Four was trying to do, there were a lot of discussions that what they wanted to do was if Fantastic Four was sequel, they're going to combine the universes with, with the X-Men. Yeah. So in order to do that, they said okay well we've got to build our shared universe and they're doing that now they got they finally got that with Deadpool that they're going to be able to do that now um, and with X-Force and all that stuff so they have that now but they were trying to do that Fantastic Four DC has that with Suicide Squad it's going to play into other things too so that's why you're able to announce those sequels or at least hope that it's going to go over well and this one the trailer went over a lot better than hmm. Fantastic yes. Four trailer went over when you put it that way with Fox like god are they lucky Deadpool hit when it did and that yeah. they actually gave that movie the chance to go into production because could you imagine like no Fantastic Four and it's like almost like where do we go now it's all they have is they don't they just they would just have the X-Men franchise which is fine um, but they would just have to keep waiting wh whether they're going to do more spin-offs because they tried to do the spin-off with Wolverine Origins and that didn't work out so yeah, it's Deadpool was like a, was a blessing for them, and also gave them breathing room for Gambit. They were allowed totally. to push yep. it yep. push it back because Deadpool was so successful. Re they're gonna re that was a really smart move by Fox. It really was. We we like to take shots at them because they made some bad decisions in the past. Though, for them to reevaluate and take back, and I hope that it's because someone goes. What are we doing with two hundred million dollars yeah. for this movie? Nobody knows who this is, and someone actually doing that and stepping back. That's a good executive. That's someone who's smart and not going to waste the studio money when they see like up oh, 60 million for 50 million for that's what it took for Deadpool. And look at the money it made. So good for them for making the right decisions. All right, guys. Now we're on to our weekly Friday segment, uh, Box Office Predictions, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is where we predict the top five movies of this coming weekend. Christian, what do you got? All right. Sorry. So here what I have. Here's what I have. This weekend I got number one. I have Zootopia. Two. I got Deadpool. Three. London Has Fallen. Four. Whiskey. Fox trotting all over the place. And <laughs> five. I have Kung Fu Panda. Perry. 
WTF. That's how I started remembering the title. When oh, you when you nice. recognize that, uh-huh. you could organize Tango and Foxtrot properly. But I, I actually have a pretty different lineup. I'm going Zootopia number one because, you know, Home made a ton of money a, yep. around this time last year. And this is a Disney movie, and it's fantastic. Then I'm going London Has Fallen, which I say <laughs> is going to come in at like 25, which is just under what Olympus Has Fallen did. So I'm having that at number two. Deadpool is going to be three. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot at four. And then I'm going Gods of Egypt at five. Okay. All right. I have the same top four as you. Zootopia, one. London Has Fallen, I, which I, th- I actually think is going to do better. I, it's a movie that, that came out that re- was received well. And then through the past couple of years, people have been, you know, actually anticipating a sequel to it. Much more than I expected because I thought the movie was just okay. Um, Deadpool's going to be at three, four, Whiskey Tango, Foxtrot, uh, or, uh, yeah, Wh- Whiskey Tango, Whiskey Fo- Tango, yeah. Foxtrot. <laughs> okay. And uh, uh, number five, I actually have The Revenant sneaking back wow. up. Uh, just because, because of the Oscars. Because the, Oscars. Yeah. the people who didn't see it, who want to see Leonardo DiCaprio's Oscar-winning performance, normally mm. you would reserve this for something like a spotlight. You're like, okay, that one. But there's... Spotlight's the one getting more theaters. But it, at this it point, is. it's so low down, I don't think that that theater boost is going to put it in the mix yeah, at all. Yeah, and, and I talked about this on our Oscars show. I was talking about how Spotlight's Best Picture win was overshadowed by Leonardo DiCaprio's win right before it. Like, no, not many people were talking about Spotlight. Everyone was talking about Leonardo DiCaprio, so I think The Revenant may sneak in at number five. That's so true. That's yeah. such a sad story, yeah. it actually. Is. Can we start doing something on Mondays? I think we've got to start thinking about our records here because there's and I you've been you've been really good. I just, this is gonna this is gonna I think benefit you. I think you've won so many times. We just kind of I think we gloss over it a little bit. We should find out. We should, we should have bragging rights on this show. I well, like that idea. All right. Well, we needed to task someone to be the person that actually records our predictions. Riley and, and then, uh, <laughs> I guess Riley, it's it's gonna be your job to task our predictions and see who's right on, on Monday. If I win, do I get another crappy movie poster in my office? You have three. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got high hopes for Monday. Yeah. I think there's a uh, there's a Stallone Dread poster in your future. I want it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, before we get on to Mailbag, I, I, we want to play you actually a short clip that actually Angela Bassett came into studio yesterday and Mark Ellis interviewed her for Who? London Has Fallen. Uh, check it out right now. You're known Huge. for your diversity and what roles you take. So what attracts you to a project? Because you've done everything. So Mm -hmm. what is it about this source material that you're like, I think I belong in that? You know, actually, I I was looking for the opportunity and welcome to work with the director, the initial director, um, Antoine Fuqua, who Mm -hmm. directed Olympus Has Fallen. We have many, long time wanted to work with each other. So when he offered me the role of the head of Secret Service, you know, I thought that was just a a new take. Usually that's a guy. You you, you know what I mean? We know who we see when we see that person cast there. But um, I I thought it would be really interesting to cast me in it. I think, you know, there had never been a woman up to that point uh, in, in that position you know, in that position of authority. Um, and, and there was a, a year after one appointed to it. So that oh, really? really, yeah, that was life imitating art. We're having an effect <laughs> on real life here, ladies and gentlemen. I can't think of a better director of the Secret Service than Lynn Jacobs, your character. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, look, you see Gerard Butler on the poster. He's got the gun. He's got the look. But yeah. you're the director I'm of bringing, that dude. I'm bringing some heart to him. You know, I mean, he has a tough go at it. And you, you can imagine what it takes in, in this man's world to reach to reach that level. So I think that actually adds to, you know, more layers of who these characters are as opposed to your cookie cutter or whatever. People come out of the theater, they 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 love, you know, the thrill, <laughs> the adrenaline, the rush, you know, uh-huh. all the explosions and the bombs, the entry, but there's a great deal of humor, there's a great deal of heart, and you really invest in the characters. And that was one of the important you know the things that it really had going for it and then to come back and to come back for a sequel really respect the audience everything that they enjoy most about it and then just amp it up even more so all right guys so if you guys want to check out that whole interview we have it on our youtube channel uh 
Mark Ellis interview and Angela Bassett. She was really super nice, super cool. Uh, before we get into mailbag, I remind you, we're going to take live Twitter questions at the end of the show. You can tweet us at Collider Video. Natasha will pick out a few, but let's get on to mailbag. What do we got first? Sam Abraham writes, hey, guys, look, loving the news of all the new shows coming up. Thinking about other thi new things I'd like to see from you, I thought, why not a guest show? You bring guests on Movie Talk all the time, so why not make a special show revolving around these people and what they do? You can bring directors, actors, ask them about the industry, and stuff like that. If you had the time and resources, would you do it? Uh, it sounds like a great idea. I totally think we'd be open to it. It's just we can't get all the guests here. Uh, it's, it's hard enough just getting one guest in for like a short amount of time. It's even harder to get two or three people in uh, together. I'd love to have some sort of round table like he's talking about. Uh, one of my favorite shows that's similar to that, that is no longer the, on the air, is when John Favreau used to do Dinner for Five. Oh, it was great. On, uh, I think he did on IFC. It was great. He just uh, went to a restaurant. He had four of his friends come and sit down. They talk about the industry and, and they'd film it while they're eating. Great idea. I just don't know. In, unless you are, uh, you know, a powerful producer or director or actor out there that wants to put all of this together, has the connections that can bring people in. Uh, that that's what we really need. Well, I mean, there's, there's a few things that we're doing also too. Not necessarily a roundtable. We are going to start bringing in more producers and writers and stuff on Movie Talk for sure. Yeah. Like for example, next Thursday, David Gambino, who was the president of Robert Downey Jr.'s company for the last four years, he's coming in to be a guest and. His his insight's amazing. We also we have a lot of kind of producers and writers kind of lined up to come in more to talk about, and th and we will definitely ask them about their time as producers and to get their insight on stuff as well. And the other thing that we we mentioned one of the main things for schmoes coming here, like one of the things we, it's it's sometimes easier for guests to come in at night. We do our show seven to nine. The first show's coming back on March tenth. We do it's a two hour show, so we have a little bit more time to sit down and have that round table. That will be happening as well. So, but as far as like the guests, we're going to bring in a lot of guests and to have guests kind of talking and being part of movie talking to get more insight just give us time i'm a big sucker for interviews but i tend to get pegged with four minute junkard interviews so i love this question being posed right now for what it's worth i'm going to south by next week and i'm going to get some extensive time with a couple filmmakers out there you know some first uh feature director filmmakers too so some really good insight hopefully into how they got their first film off the ground how they made it and all that good stuff so check out that on the youtube channel coming soon yeah we're gonna go to WonderCon and we're gonna you know go to the panels we're gonna interview some some actors and directors and producers from different movies there it's just more of a question what he's talking about having to show that all mm -hmm. like it's like a round table yeah, I guess, which tough. i love yeah it's just it may be later down the line right right all right what's next Canada Jim writes, Hey Collider crew, with the upcoming film 10 Cloverfield Lane, producer J.J. Abrams is using a first-time director in Dan Trackenberg, who also happens to co-host a movie-type podcast on the internet a few years back. Do you think Abrams had to hard sell to the movie studio to use a first-time director, or do you think at this point in time they pretty much let him do anything he wants? Keep up the great work. I think with who J.J. Abrams is, it's not that they let him do whatever he wants, but they they're going to let him, they're going to give him more leeway. So when he says, okay, there's this guy and I vouch for him and I think he's going to do a great job, they're going to listen to him. And they're more, they're saying, okay, we believe in, in you. They don't necessarily believe in that guy, but they believe in JJ's word and they'll, they'll do it. What do you think? I think it was part of the package. Mm -hmm. I think it was part of the package when, when he pitched it or when he said, hey, I want to do, whether it's another one or a spinoff, whatever the hell this thing is, is going to turn out to be. Um, but I think that it, that's, he, he's like, hey, guys, I want to do something more with the Cloverfield franchise, and this is the guy I want to do it. He was the one that brought the, the Cloverfield in the first place with the Matt Reeves, and I think that to, in order for him to get this guy on there, they said, okay, look, it's J.J. Abrams. He, it's the Star Wars director right now. He's a Star Trek director. Guy is very successful. Successful. This is what he wants. He's got a great relationship with the studio, with Paramount. So they were probably like, okay, uh, go for it. Yeah, I'd probably say that's about the way it panned out. It's probably also worth noting that Dan Trachtenberg, he didn't like just come out of nowhere. He made that, that short portal, film. The Portal, portal. Fan, fan it's, fan. it's an adaptation of a video game. Yes. I know that now, and I have tried the game. But he also he also was in talks to direct a couple of other big features, and it kind of never panned out. So his name was someone who had probably been like swirling around the industry for a while, and then, you know, for what I whatever I know, J.J. Abrams hooked up with him, and they're like, all right, let's do this together. And that was kind of the package that they brought to the studio. So I would imagine 
imagine it worked out that way. I just, I'm sorry, go another interesting note is he used to co-host an internet podcast. That he did. Yeah. Totally rad yeah. show. So <laughs> yeah, dreams. Yeah. Um, you know, but it, it also pay, it's it's JJ Abrams paying it forward. Also, yeah. it's like he from everything that, the the breaks that he's got when he was younger and people kind of giving him a shot and the way that kind of Spielberg took him under his wing. Um, this is really nice to see, and it's it's and it's not just him going. Oh, I'm going to give some random dude a shot, like you said too. It's someone that he's he's got an eye for talent, and I, I love that this panned out this way. I wish more studios would take a shot on a first time feature director. Yeah. The other one that comes to mind is West Ball for Maze Runner, and I'm like lukewarm on the second one, but if you watch the first one. One, one, it's a really good film, and there's so many signs in that that shows that this guy knows what he's doing. And he's someone who, you know, s somewhat similar to this situation, made a short that hit it big on the internet, and then all of a sudden he got a feature gig out of it, and now he's a really talented, somewhat seasoned director. But I do think nowadays, though, studios are taking bigger risks. You have someone like uh, Gareth Edwards, who did Monsters, who basically shot that on a mm -hmm. prosumer camera, edited in Premiere, and, and did visual effects and After Effects, and he got Godzilla out of that. He went from, like, super indie super super indie to something as large as Godzilla and now he's doing uh, Star Wars Rogue One and I feel like now studios are, are taking the approach of because from what I've heard like a lot of these big budget movies are now more like machines and then they get a director and as long as the director kind of has that vision they're able to they have all the other parts in place so that that they don't have to worry about the stuff they're less experienced at. Not to be negative about it but the only downside to that scenario is that I'm always afraid that they hire newcomers to kind of like push around and i'm sure that, that there's there's definitely part of that i mean it's certainly again going back to josh trank or even what happened to um was it gavin hood i think for wolverine yeah. oranges oh, yeah. um both fox um <laughs> but it, but there there are times when that certainly does happen but there are times also when they when they say okay go for it i mean look at some someone like and he, he was already established but he look look as far what nolan did with batman begins okay now Nolan had done Memento and Insomnia and other movies but he had never really done a movie like Batman Begins so the studio with, with Jeff Robinoff and Silverman they let him do his thing and I'm sure they said okay we'd like you to maybe try to do this and that but this was this was an example of someone who came in who had never been in a, not a young not a young director per se but a guy that was just not in the big blockbuster movie so it was nice to see the refreshing executive go okay do that do that do that and then we're gonna let you go. Well, you know what? Marvel's doing that, been doing that. I mean, obviously, like let's ish. Say, yeah, but I mean, okay, Joss Whedon. He he is, you know, he was well known. And he did a lot of TV shows, but I think Serenity was his only feature film that he had directed right. before Avengers. Now, Avengers is a huge, huge movie. James Gunn. James Gunn also right. had oh, done yeah. smaller movies. Uh, the Russo brothers, like, so I I feel like. Marvel and Kevin Feige have, have have kind of established that pattern. Maybe not like brand brand new, but someone that's maybe not established in the big budget genre. I, th I agree with you. I think as far as bringing new directors in, yes, I just don't think they're as hands off as some no, other no, studios. No, no, but, not but at yes, all. but yes, you're right. Like when they bring in people who like who th who thought the Russo brothers yeah. could, were going to be as great as they are in, in or as successful as they are. So they have a, Kevin Feige and those have a great eye for talent. You have Scott Derrickson doing uh, Doctor. Yep strange now right as well all right uh that's it for man Bell. let's move on to the twitter questions you can tweet us at collider video natasha what do we get up first all right no pants daniel asks <laughs> rotten tomatoes <laughs> Love percentage <that> guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> rotten tomatoes percentage versus imdb metacritic score since rotten tomatoes is based on approval percentage polarizing movies can be skewed uh personally i don't follow the imdb ratings just because they're they're very fanboy centric that doesn't mean that the ones that are rated the highest are the uh, you know bad movies or anything like that but a lot of the more fanboy stuff gets rated higher than i forgot the, what the list is but in the in the top like 10 movies it's like three of them are like i'm gonna talk about movies of all time i think two or three of them are like chris nolan films you know what i mean yeah. and not that i love i love chris nolan i love his movies but you can't tell me three of his movies are the top three movies of all time. Yeah. I, I, I would also go with Rotten Tomatoes because um, it, not just because Mark and I are certified, but the fact that it, it's you have the way that it's set up. And I know that some people are still confused. And we talked about it the other day with Rotten Tomatoes. It's that in order for a review to get 
a fresh review. It just has to be three out of five. Yeah. It doesn't mean that because a, a movie has 90% or 85% that every one of those critics loved it. That's not what it means. So I would always, I would always encourage people to go through and look at individual reviews of critics that you enjoy and that you trust their opinions on. Um, but in that, the reason I think it is effective is because you can find in that maybe there are tons of people who maybe you have the same view maybe there is someone in that 85 percent that loved the movie that you agree with or someone that's in that 85 percent that thought it was it was pretty good you can find that review in there that echoes your opinion and even and even if you're part of that 15 percent that thought it stinks or didn't think it was that good you'll be able to find those as well too so that's why i think that system works I look at IMDb every once in a while, but personally I veer much more towards Rotten Tomatoes, mainly because of the interface and because of the stuff that you were just listing, because you know how it is on IMDb, I feel like the rating is almost like an afterthought if you're not specifically going there to click on it and see what the reactions are. Whereas Rotten Tomatoes has like a pretty page for every movie. You got the, the basic synopsis at the top, you've got the basic synopsis of all the reviews on the bottom. It's, it's a very pleasing, pleasing to the eye type look that makes you be able to digest all that information and kind of like a hot second and then also with imdb people vote on movies before they even come out they, 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 it's like oh well, they haven't seen it at least rotten tomatoes it, the critics ones you know they've actually seen yeah. the movie rotten tomatoes does a good job of separating that too it's they have the section where it's like the tomato meter but then there's also the section of you know rate how rate if you want to watch it or so. i forget what they call it but it's where people some sort can of say how excited they are yeah. about it uh, yeah, I mean, with Rotten Tomatoes, I, I like it as well, as long as you understand what it is, which, which Christian was talking about. It's it's more of what was most well-liked, and that's why I feel like Pixar movies do the best on these, because you, you know, it takes a lot to hate a Pixar movie or yeah. dislike a Pixar movie. That doesn't, to me, necessarily mean it's the best movie. Like, a Pixar movie can get, like, let's say, 98 or 97% on Rotten Tomatoes, but you generally, for me, personally, they're not the best movies of the right. year, but I really like them because they they appeal to a wider audience. Which is why I might want to change my Batman v Superman number now. Because okay. I feel like Dark and Grim, it would appeal to less of the masses and then maybe maybe it would get a few negative reviews. <laughs> Damn it, I'm stuck at 71. <laughs> All right, what's next? Donald asks, hey guys, do you think movie studios watch shows like yours to get fans' reactions to change movie trailers? I don't know. To uh, change to be, trailers? I'd like to think so. I. I mean, I know some people do, uh, yeah. but I just don't know how broad in terms of the movie industry actually watches I, our show or other other reviews or stuff like that. I can tell you that quite a few. Okay. Um, it, whether because I I know for I mean we've Mark and I have been doing schmoes now for like the last seven years and like and just from the meetings that we've had with talking with people from the studios and then from since we joined over here back in the AMC days they're very aware of the show I mean I had I had lunch with with a studio publicist yesterday and and we were talking about the it, the region trying to get, put have guests on and to they studios have to, are in the business of promoting their movies as well too and they also want to be on they also want people to be on shows that fans respond to and that fans enjoy and that it and the I think what I what people don't realize about studios is that they are very aware of shows that are just opinion based and that are always giving the positive review. Mm -hmm. They like the positive reviews, but they also like the honesty because they know that fans respond to it. And that's why I think this show has succeeded. I think that that's why Schmoes has been able to do well is because we say what's on our minds. And I think that the studios are watching that. And I'll get I'll get a text or an email sometimes when I say <laughs> things like, "Oh, really? You said that?" And but there, but it's not like, "Please don't say that." Mm -hmm. It's a matter of, "Okay, well, then hopefully you like, you like the next one." There was a movie when we went and saw, oh, 13 Hours. Mm -hmm. Now, a very controversial review on the Schmoes channel with the 13 Hours review. But before we saw that movie, Mark tweeted out about uh, how he was. It was some shot at Michael Bay that he took. The publicist knew about it right away. When we got there, they said, "I I checked in and they're like we saw Mark Ellis's tweet." <laughs> and so, but they were they weren't telling him to take it down. They just they're paying attention. That's Perry? a challenge of doing interviews and reviews. Also, like I've been in so many situations where maybe I'm the only one at a festival and I'm doing a re I'm doing a review and I'm doing an interview and it's like I don't like a movie, but I don't want to ditch the person and not do the interview and I still want to celebrate the thing that they work so hard to make. So it's like, where do you even draw the line in that respect? Which is probably like a whole different discussion. Then I'm sure as well on, on the website side for Collider, I'm sure lots of people in the industry read that and they maybe have comments to you. I saw your Gods of Egypt uh, oh review boy. on the. Website. 
website. Oh boy, that that movie, that movie. I still think Jeffrey Rush is the best part of that thing. <laughs> I, I want a spinoff just of him. All right, what's next? <laughs> Alexander Burton asks, which actors or actresses need to retire, or as Harloff would say, shave their heads and go to sleep? <laughs> I say Adam Sandler and Megan Fox. Oh, I don't want Adam Sandler to retire. I, I think Adam Sandler could... Uh, could absolutely do dramatic movies. I think he's a, and I said it the other day. I just think he needs to stay away from the stuff that he's been doing lately. The 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 Jack and Jills, the Grown Ups too. Like, it's done. I, I that type that type I wish would shave its head and go to sleep. But as far <laughs> as as far as him, no. And I don't want Megan Fox to do that either. And to be quite honest, there's really I don't want to tell any actor, or actress, or director to stop making movies and don't make movies anymore. They do what they do and they love it. I don't have to like it. Like I, it's gonna I, every time I'm gonna go into a Michael Bay movie, like, Ugh. and when Jai Courtney has a lead role, Ugh. but Jai Courtney looks great in Suicide Squad, and I'm gonna call it. I'm gonna be honest about it. I think he looks like the best thing in the movie, and I hope I'm right because he's been in other roles that have. I think that when he's not in the starring role. And he's in roles like he's going to be in like Suicide Squad. And he was in that movie, The Water Diviner, which not a great movie, but he was really great in. And then the what was the Unbroken, the Angelina Jolie mm-hmm. movies in it briefly, but still good in that. There are roles and stuff that I don't want anyone to retire if that's what they want to do. I would never tell somebody to quit their job. Yeah, this idea has actually crossed my mind very often. You know, <laughs> when I when I see a movie that I don't like and someone is kind of sucking the life out of it, I'm like, oh, I wish they would just never get cast in another movie again. <laughs> but then I think about it seriously and it's like the same thing that you just said. I don't want to ever tell somebody to stop creating, especially because we're in an industry where, you know, a different script could come across your desk and something like that could really bring out something that we've never seen before from the person. But... I'm going to be honest. I have my wish I would never see you again list, but I don't want to celebrate that because this industry doesn't need that whatsoever. Yeah, I wouldn't tell anyone to retire because even if there's people that I don't like or don't care for, there's probably other people who do and they want to still see movies with that person in them. So there's no, you know, I, I hope they make movies and those other people can enjoy them. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say anyone should retire or whatever. I just hope that whoever's doing stuff like that, they're putting their best foot forward. They're, they're trying their hardest to do, you know, the best that they can. All right, what's next? Christopher Woodburn asks, what film could you guys never get sick of seeing? For me, it's The Dark Knight. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. It's really? You can keep boom. watching that over and over again? I love the movie, don't get me wrong, but yeah. it depresses me. It's, it's, a, it's just such a, it's such a fantastic movie. It's, it's one of those movies I just, I am locked in i was at sundance uh, with tiffany actually and we and we were about we just got back from shooting and it was on and we both were like yeah do we would just watch the whole movie it's such a great great movie but that and probably raiders of the lost ark empire strikes back Mm -hmm. i can name a lot of those but for the sake of giving adam sandler a little bump after that last question i'm going to (laughs) say billy madison nice i grew up watching billy madison one too many times like god knows how young i was when that movie came out and i think my mother took me to see it in the theaters and we were sitting there together and you know that style of humor wasn't really popular at the time Mm -hmm. so i think she was sitting there like what the hell did i just take like my little child to see and sure enough i'd walk around repeating all that stuff over and over and over again Uh, for me, it'd be two very different movies. One would be my favorite movie of all time, Goodfellas. Anytime it's on, anytime it's it, like I see it halfway through, I have to watch it all the way to the end. And the other one, which is very different, is Clue. I love that movie. I watched it when I was a kid. We watched me and my family watch it all the time. It's just a movie I just can't get sick of. All right, what's next? All right, Gabriel Bailey asks, "What are your thoughts on the beef between major theaters potentially blocking Netflix films?" Um, it actually, I don't have a problem with that. It, it makes sense. If, if a theater is trying to sell movie tickets to the audience and Netflix is doing a day and date, which means they're going to premiere it uh, on, on Netflix the same time they premiere in theaters, they're, you know, the, the, the theaters have a right to not show those movies because they're trying to get people into the movie theater. So I have no problem with that. Yeah, That definitely makes sense. I feel like if they do let those movies get theatrical releases, we could run into major problems in terms of the theaters just staying in business. And it, it also speaks to the issue we had in, uh, I believe it was the fall with uh, Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse and Paranormal Activity, where Paramount had decided they were going to release it on VOD, I believe, like weeks after, and all the theaters got pissed, and I think they started to pull it a bit, but 
I, I still think we're figuring out how Netflix fits into this industry. I mean, the awards campaign goes to sp speaks to that a bit. Like, I don't think anyone really knows how they're going to wedge their way in with the way the industry stands right now. Yeah, I agree with you guys. I think that it's it's because Netflix is still this brand new thing, and and people are th theaters are threatened by it, and they and I and I get it, but I also understand they're in the business of selling movie tickets, and it's like, hey back get off our turf and i and i think that will change eventually i think there'll be some kind of agreement eventually to try to where they can make it all work because i think that technology and th things in general the way theaters are going to work in the next five or ten years is going to be very different than they are today um but i i get it it makes sense there is like certain circumstances maybe they can work it out i know uh you know back when we were with amc theaters uh they did uh veronica mars the movie and that was actually a, a day and date however i think amc theaters got a cut of the yeah. actual you know sales or whatever rentals and stuff like that so maybe that's a way they can start doing that i don't know if netflix is open to that i wonder if even reversing it would make any sense where uh netflix held their movies back from netflix online and released it in the theater for x amount of weeks first I don't know. I don't know if that would work out. I don't know if there's any way to kind of figure out where this is going. All right. All right what's next? Alan McNamara asks, do fanboys and knee-jerk reactions to news slash trailers ruin your anticipation and enjoyment? Not for me. No, it's, no. Not, it's not my reaction. It's their reaction. So, I mean, let them yell and scream about, you know, things. I don't, I don't care. It's, like, it's, it's how I feel about it. You're not going to change my opinion on it. Like, look, perfect example is yesterday mm -hmm. with Ghostbusters. Um, there... A lot of people didn't like the trailer. I certainly didn't like it. I got the most ridiculous and still great YouTube message yesterday from th this troll. And he's just like, <laughs> you know, you're so wrong about that trailer. You don't know it. You, you, the reason why you don't know it is because it's a good trailer. <laughs> and you are, you're, you're, you're ruined. You don't know it. Blah, blah, blah. Someone else is right. You're the worst. Ball bag, ball bag. And I was like, this is, <laughs> this is great. But like, he was passionate about it. But he's just, he, because he's convinced he loved it. So I had to love it. No, shut up. It's like, for me, same thing with me. I'm not telling you. I'm not looking at this going, it stinks. And if you don't think it stinks, well, then you should stick your head in the toilet, flush it seven times and go, I wouldn't do that to you because it doesn't make any sense. But this guy got ball bag, ball bag, ball bag. <laughs> Shut up. We should have a segment where you just sit there and read comments. Yeah. Like comments I do. We do it on shows. It's called really? Unleash. It's called Unleash the Trolls. See? You should do, do a whole you do it in show. That voice? Yeah. You, do, you <laughs> should do a whole show in that voice. We do it. We do it oh for boy. about ten or fifteen minutes. We take. It, we play like the Gremlins theme, and and then and then we we. It's called Unleash the Trolls, and we do and we read in in really silly voices. You guys should come on and do it. It's amazing. I, I actually I didn't hate the trailer as much as you did. I did think it was underwhelming. However, I'm still like actually looking forward to the movie. Hopefully, the second trailer will be a lot better. But yeah, the other people's opinions of it doesn't ruin my my take on it. If anything, other people's opinions on something that I like tend to just like bum me out, and I right. get a little defensive. And I won't like take to the internet being like, "No, screw you! Like you're wrong, I'm right." But yeah, I'll take a little bit of a hit from it. All right, let's do two more. Cody Miller asks, is the sword and sandals genre dead? So many recent flops, Exodus, Gods of Egypt, thoughts? Uh, I don't think so. It's just, you know, I think it's just oh. one of those things like, it's like the Western where it's like, okay, we don't have as many Westerns as we used to, but we still have some that come out. It's, it's, it's just one of those things where you just got to put the, the talent, the time, the resources, you got to put them all. You guys have to remember, remember when comic book movies sucked? I mean, you have to remember that time where there was a ton of comic book movies that were terrible. And why? Because they didn't actually put the time and talent and money and effort into them. So it's that's that's where it really lies. Yeah, that's kind of my answer to this, too, is that the the movies that were just named are just not good movies. Yeah. It doesn't mean the whole genre is dead. And just to speak to Westerns, Bone Tomahawk. Mm -hmm. If you think there are no good Westerns right now, go check that out. Yeah, the Westerns are just they've always been kind of a tough sell as well but it's it's not that it's dead it's just which might be why nobody really saw bone tomahawk yeah yeah it's just it's just it's just a tough it's always been a tough genre to sell and and you know tarantino was able to pull it off because tarantino um and even hateful eight did okay it didn't as great great but it just came out at a bad but time. what do you think about sword and sandals they're talking about uh, that. yeah no i know sword and sandals movies i think that it's it's the same thing they're just like i i love sword and sandals movies i mean like gladiator is one of my one of my favorites and it, 
a lot of them are bad. I mean, like Alexander is. You remember Angelina Jolie? Alexander. It's like what is he <laughs> doing? And like those, there's certain movies they just haven't been able to do it. They, I, I wanted both the Wrath of uh, Wrath of the Titans and Clash of the Titans to be good, atrocious. Um, that that, that uh, the one with Jon Snow in it, Kit Harrington. Oh was that God, one? Pompeii. The, Pompeii. Oh, oh it's terrible. Horrible. And terrible. I wanted it to be good, and he was good in it yeah. too. But it's just the it, yeah they they don't know how to do them for some reason. But I, but I don't think they're dead. All right. What's the last one? Okay, the last one is from Mysterio. Could the Nina Simone movie be better if they cast an actress with the right skin tone? As it's getting backlash, Zoe Saldana is going to be playing her in blackface. I just read this this morning. It's getting, the movie's getting crushed. A lot of cra- reviews are just saying that it's uh, not good. Mm-hmm. I heard about it, but I haven't actually read all the news about it. it. So people actually saw the movie, or they're talking about it, the trailer or her casting of it? I think, I think that, her casting. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I have to read more about it. Yeah. Well, I guess it's just a sensitive subject right now, especially. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, that's it for today's show. I want to thank the people joining us at the table. Uh, Perry, you are... You're leaving us for a little bit, but then you're but then you're I coming am. back. I feel like I should take those posters with me and hang them up in my apartment Please. in New York just for a little while, so I don't have to leave. <laughs> I'm gonna them. post that on on the Instagram account today too. Those posters hanging in your office. We got we got to hang a couple more though. Yeah. There's, some, there's some terribly white walls in there. I'm gonna miss uh, my Optimus Prime, but you can catch me on the internet at Twitter and Instagram at pnumberoff. And Christian, where can people find you? Well, you can find me at Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. And like I was mentioning before, Schmoes know the live show. It is coming back next Thursday, March 10th. Cannot wait to have the whole crew back. Thank you again to Complex for and Collider for making that happen. We'll be back next week. If you haven't watched the show before and you want to see, well, what the hell is the Schmoes No live show? We have a full playlist up on the Schmoes No channel right now. Please go and check that out. And Natasha, where can people find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at NatashaLexis underscore. And you can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Don't forget forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash Collider Videos. Also, remember, we're going to have a lot of shows coming this month. We have the Schmodown. Yep. We have uh, TV Talk. And then maybe in the future, uh, Horror Talk as well, which I know Perry is I- interested in be- being I, on. I am so pumped. It'll finally give me the opportunity to talk about movies like Bone Tomahawk. Go <laughs> see it. Wow. Why am I like being? the uh, the PR person for that movie okay. right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. We will see you guys next week. Hey, guys. If you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.